Hello Booktube. Well, it's that time again. Another weekly read, a little bit later than usual, but life's been busy and I had my nose in a book. I'm sorry. I just couldn't stop reading to film a video. Anyway, um, I'm going to once again do this from least favorite to favorite, although I must admit that this has been a very good reading week in general. This book that I'm going to show you, first of all, was my palette cleanser. The book that I've chosen to get rid of the idea of good writing, you know, so that the next time I pick up a good book, I'm not going to feel that it's average. And in this case, I used The Caller by Chris Carter. Now, I picked this up because he is actually quite a popular author here in South Africa with regards to thrillers. I've sold quite a lot of his books over the Christmas holidays and yeah, although his picture makes me think that he's the kind of bloke I don't want to meet in a dark alley or pretty much in a well-lit one either, I thought I'd give him a try. He is supposed to have had a degree in criminal behavioral science and things like that and apparently he worked for some police agency etc before tossing in the badge and joining a hard rock group and then he tossed in the guitar and started writing about his career. So well not his career per se but writing fiction. Anyway in this story we have Robert Hunter because he couldn't have been called I don't know, something else. I know Mugabe was taken, but I'm sure there were loads of other options that would have been perhaps a little bit less cliched. And yeah, this story, look, it's your average thriller. I'm not going to lie and say it was fabulous. It was your average th thriller, but it kept me going. He knew how to work with suspense, that even though something, well, not much was happening, I still felt that a lot was happening. And it kept me turning those pages and it kept me intrigued and although the first crime scene made me feel that I needed a good dose of brain bleach and I had to read quite a few pages on because I was not going to go to sleep with that image in my head that wasn't really a bad thing because the page count it, it turned it went up <laughs> so look this isn't for everyone as I said the the crime is rather gory and I must admit the other thing, okay, my brother is doing his doctorate in clinical psychology. So I've heard a lot about psychology. And when I read books that have anything to do with psychology, I wonder what my brother would think of them, whether they are accurate or not. And I found some things in here perhaps a bit simplified. I'm not 100% sure if the trigger in this for the, the killer, the serial killer, was necessarily on but I must admit it was quite an original idea so there was this as I said it was a fast read it got rid of the idea of good writing because yeah no and um, there were also loads of typos in this at one point the wife was sacred and not scared somebody inverted the A and the C so yeah and there was also this weird line about our first twice I still have no idea what that's supposed to mean then moving on, my second favorite book, yes, only my second favorite book, is Autumn by Ali Smith. I expected to absolutely adore this, and it's not that I didn't, it's just that the next book was so much better. And yeah, look, there, there's not much to be said about this that hasn't been said already. Um, this is the first Brexit novel to come out, and what I did enjoy with this was how Ali Smith really uses duality to convey the mixed feelings about the, um, Brexit, how the nation was torn and some people thought this was great and other people thought it was dreadful. There's a fabulous chapter in here, very short, where she covers it. Um, I also like how her sense of humor creeps in throughout because she must have quite a wicked sense of humor but it's subtle. It's not, you know, pie in your face kind of stupid um, slapstick comedy but it's subtle and I enjoyed it. I saw it coming through and um, the other thing that I really liked in this was the relationship between um, Daniel Gluck, who was 101, and Elizabeth with an S, who was in her mid-30s. And they met when she was around 8, if memory serves me right. And although it's a non-linear timeline, you get just enough to realize just what a special relationship the two of them had. And I really did enjoy that as well, the way they spoke about storytelling and art and all sorts of things but yeah autumn is the season of change so 
it was a time for change and we're going to see what winter will bring soon so this was a good read the other thing is a lot of people have said that you know they find Ali Smith a bit daunting with her experimental writing and this one was nowhere near as hardcore as some of her other books have been I know that when I read how to be both the beginning chapter of mine because I started with the artist in the past that one was kind of really mind-blowing it was like way feelings back to university days and postmodernism and I was going what the hell is going on here but I persisted and it made sense later but this didn't have anything like that it it was pretty awesome I quite enjoyed this and I think anybody should be able to well any experienced reader I don't think you need to have university degrees behind your name you should be able to manage with this and get something out of it so what would be the favorite book for the week what could possibly beat Ali Smith's autumn and it is Alan Payton's Cry the Beloved Country man I'd been putting this book off for a long time the word cry suggested that this suggested that this was going to be highly depressing the beloved country is just more heartbreaking because South Africa is a beautiful country if you just take the geography I mean we've got everything that you could need you've got tropical you've got desert you've got Mediterranean you've got savanna you've got everything here um, beautiful mountains beautiful oceans beautiful beaches as a country on its own it is an absolutely stunning land and there's so much potential here with the people artists writers musicians you name it and in that regard it could be a beloved country and I looked at this title and I went oh this is going to be another depressing book and although I'm not going to say that this was, you know, the Joy Luck Club, although that was also quite depressing, um, we're just going with titles here. Um, although I can't say this was a depressing book, it was a book that actually gave me a sense of hope. It didn't shy away from the problems. This was written in 1948, so this was before apartheid got to the height of its meanness and stupidity. And... It shows you, it predicts what's going to happen, but at the same time it gives you hope. So you have two men in the story. This is unfortunately going to contain spoilers because I don't know how to discuss this book without spoilers. The one is a black man, he is a minister, and he goes through to Joburg to find his family members. First it was, um, or was it his brother or his, wife, his sister's husband who left first? And then his sister left to go and find him. And then his son left to go and find her. And all these people stop writing and they never come home. And he gets a letter from another minister to inform him that his sister is very sick. And he needs to come and collect her. So they use all their life savings for him to go through to Joburg. And one thing leads to another. He finds his sister. He finds his brother. And then he finds his son who has committed a murder. And then in part two, you go to the White family where you have the father of the son who has just been murdered. And the son was somebody, well, if I could find this chapter, I should have put a tab in it, but I was so involved in reading it, I didn't even think of tabs. And you have the son. He was trying to fight for black causes. And what he said made so much sense how the tribal life was not immoral but it, it, the people were not prepared for the life that they were forced now to lead in the cities because the tribal life had not prepared them for that and how you know it was understandable at one point in time to exploit uneducated labor but there was no reason to maintain uneducated labor just so that you could exploit it now that one knows better and oh the, the wisdom in this was fabulous but of course he was the guy that was murdered and then you have the contact between the white father and the black father. And it left me with such a feeling of hope. This has to be one of the most moving, one of the most beautifully written books I've read in uh, decades. I think there was something quotable on almost every single page. It was just absolutely brilliant. And after reading this, Ali Smith's Autumn only seemed a good read. Whereas this was fabulous. I, I really, your, the writing, the wisdom, the way he captures Africa, the way he captured the people, I couldn't fault him on it. 
I'm, I suppose that if I had to put some effort in, I could, but I don't really want to. I, I like this just as it was. So after reading those three books, I felt I needed something perhaps a little bit more bland. Um, maybe another palette cleanser, although not necessarily notably poor writing. So I thought I would pick up 44 Scotland Street by Alexander McCall Smith. And I'm only 30 pages in because I picked it up late last night when I should already have switched the lights off and gone to bed. But we will see what we will see. So far I'm enjoying it. Um, this is strange because he apparently was chatting to Amy Tan, um, the author of The Joy Luck Club, which I mentioned earlier by accident, um, the bone setter's daughter. And um, they were having a, a chat somewhere in America and they were talking about how novels were written back in the time of Dickens where every um, edition in the newspaper there was a new installment of the book and he said that he would like to do something like that and so or another he ended up doing it and this book was published one chapter at a time daily in a newspaper which must have been quite something because daily in a newspaper takes a lot of work uh, he said in the introduction here that by the time he was getting to the end of it he was only th he had only written three days ahead and I'm pretty sure that that must have been quite nerve-wracking. So I'm going to be curious to see what effect this has on his writing because, as he said, and as logic will obviously point out, you can't go back and change. Once it's written, it's written, and it's published, and it's read. So I'm seeing where this is going to take me. So far it's seeming all right. Well, that was last week's reads. I absolutely enjoyed it. I can't say that I could fault any of them other than maybe the sub-editor in The Caller because yeah I don't know how many mistakes they did catch but they left some Lulu's go past. I look forward to catching up with videos I'm afraid that this last weekend I read. I had a hectic week at work and I just wanted to be well do some serious introverting so I climbed into bed with my book and I read and when I finished that book then I picked up the next one. It was a little bit embarrassing. One shouldn't do that when they're almost 40. Anyway, that's me for now. Bye!